you very much. Good evening. <laughs> I must introduce myself. I am the bonsai Steve Vizard. <laughs> Actually, I'll be honest with you, I was a wee bit nervous, you know, as I walked on first. But it was quite encouraging, because as I walked on, a lady over here on the right said, doesn't he remind you of Clint Eastwood? Just <laughs> sitting over there, sipping the metal polish. Ah, well. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful, actually, to leave a cold, miserable place like England and come to a warm, miserable place like Australia. <laughs> I see it. Economic troubles abound, don't they, really? Paul Keating, I heard on the news tonight, saying, we are not in recession, he said. <laughs> yeah. He also said that he'd bumped into Elvis at the deli counter at Coles. <laughs> I, 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 I do not, however, intend to do any political jokes tonight because I'm being in a, a guest in the country, and apart from that, I'm not a member of any organised political party. I'm a liberal. <laughs> I'm hoping to uh, I'm hoping to do that's the second reason I shouldn't have done any political jokes anyway I am hoping I am hoping to do I am hoping to do uh, I'm hoping to do something and I'll tell you what in a minute I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I knew I was hoping to do something um, you may be wondering what I'm talking about well I you may not be wondering about that at all. You may be wondering, is it true that Mickey Mouse wears a Ronnie Corbett watch? You may be wondering. Anyway, you, I am hoping to do... I'm hoping to do a two Ronnie show while I'm here, but Ron Barassi will not return my calls. Now, I, uh, I've actually come out here to help to support the English uh, Ashes team. And, well... <laughs> did anyone see which way they went? <laughs> I heard that they left the country in raincoats and false beards. Um, I've also heard that Graham Gooch intends to give up first-class cricket. <laughs> he does, however, hope to remain captain of England. Now, we are... We're, we're having a bit of a cold snap in England at the moment, so I don't have to worry personally, because if I want a tan, I don't bother about sunbeds, I just jump in the pop-up toaster. <laughs> but fortunately, I, fortunately, I've got a, I've got a, excuse my laughing, it's the first time I've heard that one. It is rather good. <laughs> I, fortunately, I have, I have got, I have got a time-honoured system that works on these occasions. Um, uh, when we get a cold snap at home, the electric blanket is on the blink. I get my wife's hair dryer and I plug it in and turn it up to full blow and uh, under the bedclothes with it. Wonderful. Tried it the other night. Worked a treat. Warmest toast. Woke up at four o'clock in the morning ballooning over Manchester. Now, I... 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 I have... Quite exciting. Actually, I've noticed... I, it's quite exciting because last week, you may be interested to know or you may not be... Um, it's none of my business if you are interested anyway, I, w I was actually uh, I went to Ronald Reagan's birthday party which was very nice I stood in the middle of the cake holding a sparkler and we, now we have got I've just I've just noticed rather a subtle edit's gone on here because I haven't mentioned that I'm actually in Melbourne to appear at the Hilton Hotel which is rather mid uh, uh, which I've just uh, sorry, yes a little bit <laughs> A little bit of discreet editing went on while I was having a cup of coffee. No, and I'm very happy to be there. It's a beautiful round hotel. Last week they sacked a waiter for being caught with his thumb in the soup, uh, and a topless waitress for two similar offences. But anyway, <laughs> we, um, we we were we have got some great guests for you tonight to meet. We were hoping to be joined by John Squibb, the Human Torch, but unfortunately he's gone out for the evening. We will <laughs> we will, however, we will, we will however. We, you, that's all you deserve. We will, however, be meeting the one and only Victor Borg. And, uh... <laughs> He'll be chatting to us and performing. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce you the queen of the news beat, Jennifer Kite. <laughs> Thanks, Ronnie. Good evening, everyone. The government will be on the defensive when federal parliament resumes tomorrow, adding to its economic woes the massive loss of another Labour-controlled state bank and the failure of the wool price support scheme. The government finally succumbed today. After months of battling to keep the wool industry's reserve price scheme afloat, it accepted the inevitable that billions of dollars of debt and mountains of wool were simply too high a price to pay. 
you just cannot go on and on and on uh, guaranteeing billions of taxpayers' funds uh, knowing that you're going to head into a situation that the industry can never crawl out of. Also struggling under billion-dollar debts, the South Australian government forced to bail out its state bank it was getting no sympathy from Federal Treasurer Paul Keating. The bank's losses, Mr Keating said, were simply inexcusable. I think anyone who loses a billion dollars, uh, or any bank board that loses a billion dollars, uh, has uh, got it way, way wrong. Federal opposition leader John Hewson agrees, as he and Prime Minister Hawke engaged in a rare display of bipartisanship tonight at an international trade promotion in Canberra. The real interest here was centering on tomorrow's events, the resumption of federal parliament and the resumption of the economic debate between the government and the opposition. To the Gulf War now, and a decision on when to launch the ground assault against Iraqi forces in Kuwait is likely to be made in the next 12 hours. But Saddam Hussein has told his people that in the eyes of God, they have already won the war. In his second address to the nation since the conflict started, Saddam showed no sign of buckling under the pressure of an imminent Allied ground offensive. Saddam Hussein said, we have entered the fourth week of this aggression and with every day and every hour, the Iraqis hold more strongly to what they believe in. The timing of the ground war and what sort of offensive it will be will come after the president has been briefed by Defence Secretary Dick Cheney and Military Chief General Colin Powell. They returned to Washington today after hearing the views of commanders in the field. On his way home, Secretary Cheney said the next stage of the war will be decisive, but no pushover. Uh, we did not assume the air campaign would be easy, and we don't want to assume that the next phase of uh, the ground campaign would be easy either. Uh, that's not a safe assumption upon which to plan. In Western Australia, authorities are concerned at the way a remote Aboriginal community spent its $128,000 tax refund on a five-day drinking binge. Waluna is a lonely spot on the edge of the Simpson Desert, a thousand kilometres north of Perth. It's a small community of 300 people who run their own successful business enterprise, including emu farming. Last week, the community's collective tax refund arrived, $128,000. Today, five days later, the money is gone. Most of it over the bar or bottle store of the town's only pub. They got nothing to live for, just really just um, a local hotel. Their culture's down the drain at the moment. It's down the drain. Perhaps ironically, the community has been considering another investment, buying the pub. New South Wales police hold grave fears for the safety of a baby boy abducted from his home five days ago. They say he is unwell and needs medical attention. Little Nathan Schaefer was snatched from his cot sometime on Wednesday night. Five days later, his mother is frantic. I've had no sleep since he's been gone. I keep looking at his cot in the bedroom where he's taken. I keep thinking and praying that he'll come home. Forbes police believe a 15-year-old girl who stayed at the Schaefer home on the night of the abduction may be able to help. Tomorrow is Nathan's first birthday. Self-proclaimed anti-nuclear campaigner John Dixon Jenkins pleaded guilty today to seven counts of kidnap relating to a siege at the Bendigo prison in 1987. He described the siege, in which he was armed with a gun and a homemade bomb, as dumb and recommended he be sentenced to a million hours community service. In court in Brisbane today, one of Queensland's ten most wanted criminals. Bart Vosmeyer, a convicted armed robber, has escaped from prison twice in the past two years. Today, he again showed his dislike of captivity. I want life to live <laughs> and Ronnie, that's our news tonight. Ah, thank you very much, Jen. Thank you. Very nice. It's interesting to see that item about the prison because I see in this morning's paper there was a bit of panic this morning at Pentridge when it was realised that 26 prisoners had put their names down for a picnic lunch. <laughs> there we are. Thanks. Now we'll be... We'll be... We'll be... Uh, <laughs> it's a very tough room, this, isn't it? I, uh, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be back soon with a young newcomer I'd like you to meet. So see you again. <laughs> Well,
Well, every so often in television, an outstanding new talent emerges. Someone who has that indefinable something that puts him way ahead of the rest. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone like that tonight, but I, I would like you to put your hands together to welcome someone we just grabbed off the street. Not true at all. Mr. Steve Visor. <laughs> Lovely to have you on the show, Steve. It's a great, it's a great pleasure to be here, bro. <laughs> it's five minutes I didn't have to do. <laughs> Tell me the question, the obvious question. You must have been asked this before. I know, boring, I know. But what does it feel like to be, you know, graced with such height? <laughs> In which respect? The In which, I mean, tall. Tall. Mm. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, well, I, it's, it's interesting. Being uh, tall, I just... Uh, came back from on holidays. I went to Ethiopia actually. Uh, oh yes, I, I did. I went yes. on to to do a, uh, a documentary, and uh, I was I flew Air Ethiopia, mm. which is arguably forget the arguably it's the world's worst airline. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was very cramped conditions. Uh, yes. to, to the point, they don't actually have seats. They have more. It's more like pews. Oh, right. And um, <laughs> people were struggling to get into the toilet so that because the seats are more comfortable than the oh, toilet. Right. <laughs> This, this is a really, you know, we're talking a really bad airline. And uh, uh, this plane was so old it actually took up from a crouching position. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know. <laughs> Stopped to refuel and took on wood. That's yeah, awesome. that's yeah. the sort of thing. Yeah. No, no smoking sign came up in Latin. Yes. It's, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it was a pretty uh, reasonably old, uh, old plane. But, you, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you get cramped. I mean, yes, right. Cramped. Right, but there are advantages, of course, obviously. Uh, yeah, um, none, well, none that spring to no, mind right, immediately. Right, right. <laughs> what now you, well, you, you, uh, you also, I know you've been to Ethiopia and you have been back at work a week. Yes. And you had a lovely yeah. weekend, the first weekend of lecture. Did you, did you do something? I actually uh, went to, uh, I went to, I'm glad you asked it, because I went to... <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plan any of this, did no, we? No, no. I went to, <laughs> I went to... Uh, no, actually, I went to I went to uh, the, the newsreader. Um, you went somewhere. I went. Sure, I yes, did. Yes. I went to. Uh, Four times so far. <laughs> Where the hell did I go? I went to um, Jennifer Kite, who was our newsreader, who yes. you introduced before, the yes. queen of the queen, queen of the. Uh, what is she? Queen of the news. Beat. That's it. Queen, She's of, the the queen news of the news. Beat. Beat. Yeah. As opposed to the floor thing. Uh, the, um, Went to uh, went to her place for dinner because she was cooking uh, dinner for me, yes. which is what you would. And uh, she uh, she she actually it was a lovely dinner. Mm. But then again, <laughs> but then again, I'm a suckler for mince on toast. So. <laughs> but she, um, no, it was good. It was it was a it was a fabulous dinner, and oh, she well, whipped up a storm. Oh, it was wonderful! A, it was great. Nice. How, how are you finding Australia? Wonderful, very lovely. Yes, the weather's been beautiful, and the wine's lovely, and the grub's lovely, and the audiences are lovely. And they it's are, aren't very they? Nice, yeah. <laughs> Oh, great! Really terrific. Well, what is uh, this trip number? Trip number for you? This is trip number fourteen, really. I mean, yes, about fourteen years been coming uh, to Australia. We even had a. We stayed. Uh, we were over for a year, uh, a complete year, once with the two daughters. Went to school in Sydney about twelve years ago. So we feel, you know, quite at home really. We enjoy it very much. And what do you do it. when you're in Australia? What are the things? Well, do you mean the work from the from, from work point <laughs> yeah, of view? Well, you know, any point of view. Any point of view. Yeah. Well, most important, I come to work usually oh, to you know, uh -huh. play the clubs and the theatres uh, and feel free, have a drink. But, but thanks. And, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I, as I say, <laughs> play a bit of golf, yep. uh, which is lovely, and the Melbourne famous for its great courses. Eat and drink the wine, travel, see the sun. And are you the, a good golfer? Um, not by... Not by you know, general standards, you know, but I, I, I enjoy it and I practice hard. Today I had nine holes, played five, fell down four. But I mean, I am, getting, I am, I am. <laughs> I walked out in my big check cap, you know, the Greek keeper rush. That's these bloody mushrooms earlier this year. And, but I, no, I do. I, I come from Edinburgh, the home of the game, so uh, um, I, it's sort of in my blood. But I'm not really wonderful, but I, I have great pleasure from it. You know. Do you have a caddy? Uh, 
not usually. No. At home we have at home we have more. It's a funny thing really about the difference. And I was asking somebody the other day. At home, um, in uh, you know, you can still get boys at the weekends who will carry clubs, you know, to earn a few dollars, <laughs> a few a few dollars. They reaction a lot. This, aren't they? But but you, but you but you nobody will do that over here. You don't find that over here. That you know somebody wants to earn a buck to carry. Not unless they work for a state bank. No no. <laughs> No, so um, but you have carts and things. No, I carry a little pencil bag. You know. When did now you? How long did you work with uh, Ronnie Barker? Ronnie for? Barker. Oh, about twenty-two years we worked together. Uh, An before. extraordinary association. It would have to be one of the one of the best associations that uh, of any uh, of any comic you are. I mean, it really was. Yeah. Thank you. Well. Um, very, very kind of you to say that. Um, it was a very happy relationship, and there was some uh, kind of getting together of two people who were not a double act in the same way as people are a double act, but we were probably two character comedians and partly actors and partly a bit of everything, so we you know, could do most of the material that was available to us. Really. Yeah, it, w it was exceptional, because in most comic partnerships, there's, there's a straight man and a fall guy, but in fact you both did everything. That's right, that's right. And it makes more material available to you, because wh whatever's written you can sort of do, because there is no set uh, preconceived idea of which roles we should play. And of course that was the benefit of it all. And we, and we got on well together and we had very similar sense of humour and agreed on what was funny and what wasn't funny, and so it was a very, very happy relationship. Do you have some good memories of those times? Well, yes, there's wonderful memories, really. I mean, people often say, you know, funny ones, because, but Ron and I were, I suppose, took it so seriously. It was a drawing board venture for us that we sat down and had all the scripts and made them all and edited it all like a magazine and put it together rather than get up and sort of did it much. We didn't do anything off the top of our head. Huh? But I suppose the, 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 the loveliest uh, story about the two of us, which may have been her before, was that Ron wrote a lot of the stuff, and, of course, in the early stages, and in order... Uh, not that we wouldn't be prejudiced in choosing his stuff for the awkward uh, position to be put in. He wrote under a pseudonym, you know, and he wrote under this pseudonym, Gerald Wiley. And we kept accepting all this mate excellent material, and I kept saying to Ronnie, this fella, Gerald Wiley, who is he? And he, he said, well, I don't know. He said, he comes through my agent, Peters, and uh, I think he may be a, a short story writer or a novelist or a playwright even who doesn't want to name him. And he said, he kept turning up more and more amazing stuff. And uh, we made a book on who it might be, and I mean, there were most remarkable writers in the book, Tom Stoppard and Pinter and all no. sorts of people, because the stuff was such great quality that he wouldn't reveal himself. And then at one stage, there was one particularly good sketch, which suited, Ron said suited me, and he said, why don't you make, try to do a deal to buy the rights of it for the stage and the theatre and cabaret and everything. So I did, and I got my agent to ring up, and uh, they came back with a horrendous price, about $5,000 or something. And, they put, or, and Ronnie the next day said, did you get on about it? I said, yes, for $5,000. Oh, he said, it's ludicrous, ludicrous price. <laughs> I mean, I, he said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I mean, offer them, offer them, offer them, offer them 2000 and everything. And the next day, the agent went back to offer to that. And he came back, then the agent said, well, very nice. Gerald Wiley has very kindly said, you can have the worldwide rights for the sketch because of the way you performed it on television, for nothing. So I thought, well, that's wonderful. So I went back to Ronnie Barker and said, this Gerald Wiley is a real toff. I mean, he's given me the right to the sketch. And that's, you know, so I have to do something. So I got together, had some cut glass goblets engraved, GW, you know, six. And at the end of the series, we were going to have this Chinese dinner when Gerald Wiley was going to appear. And there was this table set for 24 people, and the one seat was vacant, you know. And in the afternoon in the studio, Ronnie said, I have to tell you, that I know who Gerald Wiley is. I said, oh my God, who is he? He said, it's me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he walked into the dinner and he had his goblets of Gerald Wiley and he keeps them forever um, because he stopped writing after that under the name of Gerald Wiley. Once he'd blown his cover, he had to write as Ronnie Barker. But um, it was a wonderful idea because of course it meant we could choose the material, accept it or turn it down without feeling guilty, really. How long are you out here for this time, Ronnie? Um, out here for another three weeks. Um, so I'm in the Hilton the rest mm -hmm. of this week, then and I go to Coolangatta and then to Perth and um, then home. Oh, well, so look, I hope you have a fantastic stay. It really is. It's, it's well, a delight to uh, Well, it's been you. lovely to meet you and lovely to sit behind this desk, if a bit fearsome, a bit terrified I was. Oh, thank you. did a, a great <laughs> job. And, and I think uh, we're, um, we're going to take a break, but uh, Ronnie, thanks so much for joining us. And, and come back and join us again, please.
lovely Blake, Ronnie Corbett. Lovely, lovely, delightful man. Actually, Ethiopian Airlines is a shocker. They, um, the, uh, you get non-smoking or smoking, and that's just the engines. The, uh, <laughs> they actually, at the start of the flight, they, have, they pull down the screen for the safety film, and they have, they've obviously got this made up, and they say, in the event of a crash, and then, I couldn't believe this, I'm sitting there with a guy from World Vision, they say, in the event of an aeroplane crash, they roll in news footage of what an aeroplane crash looks like. <laughs> and you're sitting there. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're the only airline that have a frequent crashes club. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Food was a bit light on too. They give you bottles and you see what you can scrape from the rest of the passengers. <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. We, uh, we have a segment we call... Uh, we have the world's most Catholic floor manager. He's been away for us with a little time. Peter O'Connor, he's back with us. What have you been up to, Pete? Um, Crying well, out. I shouldn't be a lot of time. Um, Hawaii? Yeah, a little holiday. Now, yeah. what have you been doing up was the basic question. Well, um, holiday. Holiday. Yeah. yeah you're good. looking fit. Fit as a fiddle. I'm feeling good. Hey? Yeah. What are you, what's in your mouth? Um, that's a mint. Eh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Changed, uh, yeah, well, well. Good to see you again, Pete. Um, <laughs> Pete, are we doing viewer faxes now? What are we doing now? What, were we, what was on the agenda for right now? Do, what, does no. anyone have any view on what we're supposed let's, to be doing right now? Do we, let's, viewer faxes, yeah. please. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dear Steve, love the show, except uh, for the thank you. Uh, question. What do you call a mushroom with an eight-inch stalk? A fun guy to be with. <laughs> That's from uh, Torsten Beck of Namber in Queensland. Thank you, Torsten, for the humorous fact. <laughs> Dear Steve, there is a stud in my street named Wayne. I presume that's the stud, not the street. There is a stud in my street named Wayne, and I love him. <laughs> From Lorraine. <laughs> oh, yeah, Lorraine, you old thing. Uh, dear Steve, uh, the Variety Club held its annual Australian Master Celebrity Prime Golf Tournament today. The runner-up in the celebrity section was your own Glenn Robbins. Whoa, Glenn. <laughs> Um, this is from Tim Evans. Tim is a well-known, uh, well-known, uh, funny man, a nice guy. P.S. I won Sweet F.A. <laughs> Read it now. Uh, to give you an idea of how well I went, on the first tee I lost two balls, and that was in the ball washer. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. I think uh, what we actually might do, we want to do a, uh, we want to do a show from a viewer's home. So if you'd like us to do a television show from your home, could you either write into us or facts into us. The, uh, the address is Post Office Box 9907 in your capital city. There. Or fax in on 0369 telling us why we should do a show from your house and we'll do it next week. Believe it or not. Viewer faxes. Thank you. <laughs> Shocking airline, Ethiopian Airlines. They actually, the plane I saw was a uh, Fokker. At least I think that's what he said. If you've, ever, <laughs> if you've ever wondered who the funniest man in the world is, the New York Times described our next guest as just that. Would you please welcome the legendary Victor Borger. <laughs> He's, uh, he, he left. Who are you? <laughs> Victor, it is a, indeed a great pleasure to talk to you. You were, you were indeed a child uh, prodigy. Not anymore. 
what age did you actually start playing the uh, piano? Uh, what did I what? Play the piano. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. <laughs> what age to actually start playing? Uh, the, piano, the piano, yes. Do you play any other instruments apart from the... Why, do I have to? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have never tried, I don't know. It's not one of those things. I mean. Do you play piano? Not recently, no. Very good. Um. <laughs> <laughs> why, do you, why do you ask that question in the first place? Well, it's just a... I, I, have, you ever, um, have you ever offended classical purists with your... Who? Classical purists. I don't even know him. A lot of people would say that uh, at 82, that, that's, that that probably is an old age to be doing the sort of uh, things that you're doing, and yet you're still going at 100 miles an hour. I'm doing nothing. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you keep fit? Pardon? Do you keep fit? Fit. That, that's what you said, yeah. Yeah. Keep what? Fit. <laughs> Fit? What's that? That is uh, healthy. Are you keeping healthy? Yes, these I'm days? keeping fit. Fit. <laughs> and I play piano. <laughs> yes. <it's... laughs> what are you doing to uh, to keep fit these days? You, I play uh, the piano. To keep. Fit? <laughs> now you came uh, to Australia, unless our researchers. I did. Of... Yes, Otherwise, you, I couldn't have been, been here. here. Of course, <laughs> you actually came to Australia on the QE2. On what? The QE2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, I wanted the QE1, but it wasn't available. <laughs> I, yeah, I heard you say you were in uh, in uh, Afghanistan, was it? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Well, Ethiopia. Is that where you were? Oh. Yeah. It's uh, uh, in Africa. No, is that where it is? Yeah. I was. Uh, I've what else do you know about it? <laughs> Pretty much it, really. Um. <laughs> I was there also. Have once. you been there? Yeah. What, what did you think of it? I didn't think much, but I mean, uh, at that time, I was very upset because we were flying into the country and we were flying over the ocean on a, at, at uh, uh, what is it, 27, you know, DC 27. DC 3? It's, 20, it's 27. Uh, 27. 27, yeah. Oh, good. I had to take it because that was the one. Was the only one that was... And we were in the uh, late afternoon, almost evening, and the captain came to the, uh, the microphone and he said that we have a little problem. One engine is... Uh, we have failed at one engine, engine number one. But don't worry because we are maintaining our altitude. This is really a fact. Yeah. And uh, we might be late, uh, half hour late, getting in. And uh, he said, "Just don't worry." That was the time, of course, when everybody started worrying. <laughs> and then everything was all right. <laughs> then he came back. <laughs> About a half hour later, I say, I'm sorry to uh, tell you that we have another little problem. The engine number two is failed now because there must be something wrong with the fuel. And uh, he said, we are still maintaining our altitude. Don't worry, don't worry. We, we are, we are, we are uh, safe. Uh, we might be maybe an hour, an hour and a half late getting it, of course. So the fellow next to me said, I hope the third engine is okay. Otherwise, we will stay up here all night. <laughs> Uh, you, 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 in your spare time, are a, quite a, a, a well-known boatsman. Yes. I come off uh, QE2. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big boat. That's a big... That was, it's a beauty. Yeah. See, in, your, lovely, uh, yeah. in your spare... Do you have a yacht of your own or a... Uh, do you Not a yacht. Sail? I have a boat. 
Uh, well, I don't like to call it the yacht. It's 400 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and Have... 402 feet, my own car. How many people required to sail your boat? One. It's not many people. No, it's not a big boat either. <laughs> you, um... They're small feet. Do you, do, you, are you, uh, do you spend much time sailing? No, uh, I don't have much time to do it, but I spend as, as much time as I have to do it. And well, that's... Where are you actually based? Pardon? Where are you based? Where is your... Where, where I'm do sitting you sitting right here. Yep. <laughs> where did you call... Uh... <laughs> Connecticut. Connecticut. We live in Connecticut, yeah. When I'm not here, of course. And, and how much time of the year would you spend in uh, Connecticut, roughly? A couple of hours. <laughs> I don't know. I don't figure it out. I, I think I would say maybe three months of the year spread out over. Uh -huh. And what do you do in your spare time? I mean, we know I wind my watch. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a list? Who are you? <laughs> I said to Ron when he came out, I said, you use him more often because he's terrific at the, at the, on the desk there. He did a great job, didn't he? Wonderful. Wonderful. I was very him. much in, uh, uh, amused by him. As well. And then I came. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You could be good also. You could be good also if you try. <laughs> some of the... Be, some of the... <laughs> Some of the, the you have performed with some of the uh, the biggest names uh, in the world of showbiz and, and elsewhere. Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby. Who? Frank Sinatra, the singer. Oh. Okay. Uh, Crosby. Who? Bing Crosby. Singer. Singer. Uh, great memories. <laughs> you seem to have them. We, we, we might actually of take... Of course I have great, great memories. memories. Yes. <laughs> what else would you like to know? <laughs> of course I have great... I have great memories of this uh, uh, particular uh, event here, this strange event that <laughs> in which I'm involved right now. Victor, I thank you for that. And we, we, You're we're very gonna, welcome. Thank you. We're going to actually take a break, and when we come back, I'd be delighted if you would, uh, because you, being one of the great musicians of the world, I'd appreciate it if you'd Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Victor Borger, we're going to take a break. Back after the break with Victor Borger and a performance. Stick around. This is live. Yeah. This is live, and I'm with the delightful Victor Borger, who actually came out here on the QE2, and I think uh, yep. he's here. Uh, if, I think, uh, Victor, would it be too much if I asked you to play for yes. us? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, we should go. Did you want me to come over? Yes. Piano? Yeah, yeah the piano. Oh. Oh, that one. 
Do you know that one? No, no, I don't. Neither do I. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> let me see now. Oh, I often had uh, so many requests, you know. Uh, Claire de Lune. Uh, oh, yeah. You know that one? Uh, yeah. Okay. Would you like to hear Claire de Lune? Yeah. Okay. I wish I knew it. <laughs> it begins up here. Wait a minute. One, two, three. <laughs> Something else. This takes too long. I'm, I'm going to play. Uh, can you get your hands up? Thank you. <laughs> Just want to see what happens here. <laughs> I can't fold this thing again. Can you fold it? <laughs> I'm going to play a little of the Moonlight Sinatra. <laughs> Sinatra. <laughs> Do you speak Japanese? Do you understand? No. You don't? <laughs> I speak a little Japanese, and this is very interesting. How so many Japanese people here in 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 Australia? Oh. I learned to speak. I don't know if you're interested in this, but <laughs> I sit down. <laughs> I learned to speak Japanese with a, a wonderful method with which you can learn anything while sleeping. Uh, under the pillow in your bed you put a cassette player uh -huh. and then you insert a cassette on which must be what you wish to learn of course. In my case it was lessons in the Japanese language. And uh, you run it every night until, this is really the fact, I know you won't believe no. it, but this is a fact. <laughs> you run it every night until you have absorbed subconsciously what is on the tape. It's as simple as that. And uh, it may take weeks or months, but, and I don't speak it perfectly well, but I, I, what can you say? Well, well, I don't have to say anything, but I can speak it. <laughs> the trouble is I can only speak it when I'm sound asleep. <laughs> I can say uh, uh, Toyota, things like that. <laughs> I'm going to play, this will take a long time, it'll take about 45 minutes. 
Do we have 45 minutes? Well, no, we've got, uh, we've got about uh, one minute. One Is minute. there anything you can play in a minute? I can play... In a half a minute, I can play the minute waltz with one hand. <laughs> well, I think we have to... Uh, The remarkable Victor Burger, the minute waltz in, a, in, in half a minute. This is the Moonlight Sinatra. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, time is up, I'm sorry. Remarkable Victor Burger. More after the break. Thank How you. are you? I'm fit as a fiddle, and thanks so much for dinner on Saturday night. It was, quite it was right. delightful. Would you like to give back the silverware? <laughs> 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 now, listen, was Ethiopian Airways as bad as you make out? Uh, yeah, yes. Come on. <laughs> no, they were. They were shocking. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. yeah they, had, they had the world's biggest sick bags, and, uh, <laughs> and they were already half full. <laughs> No, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have asked that. I asked. Uh, it was not dissimilar to your dinner party. No, it was, <laughs> no, no, it was, that was delightful. It really was. Did you cook that spaghetti? Of course. Well, how come every time you went into the kitchen, you closed the door? <laughs> why did you do that? So, I didn't make too much of a noise. Rubbish. And why were you in there for three quarters of an hour before you brought the food out? I was cooking. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's yeah. the way it usually goes. Yeah. Hey, listen, good show tonight. I thought your guests were fantastic. Aren't they the Victor Burger and Ronnie Porter, the most delightful guys? Wonderful. Listen, we're going to take a break. We'll be back after the break with the weather and a bit of a chat. Stick around. This is live. <laughs> Jen just disclosed the reason she was locked in the kitchen for half an hour was that she they got those hard door handles and she had butter on her hands and she couldn't get it to turn. She was stuck in her own mother's kitchen. You mean incomplete. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> have you got any uh, headlines for tomorrow, please, Jen? A quick look at the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, they have a rather disturbing story tomorrow from a New South Wales Ombudsman report which claims ambulance services are putting Aborigines' lives at risk by refusing to go to their communities or transfer them between hospitals. So a rather disturbing story. That's an appalling state of affairs. We've got a big show tomorrow night, Jim. We've got uh, Brian Bury Slow Club, and we're going live to England. Brian Bury going to talk about uh, life in general now that he's left the nine National Nine Network and Fantastic. the circumstances. And you nice bloke, Brian. Uh, the weather is standby weather. Tomorrow is that's what the weather looks like. There you go. Memorise it and enjoy it tomorrow. Thanks for being with us, Australia. We'll see you tomorrow with Brian. Thanks for our guest tonight, uh, Ronnie Corbett and Victor Boyle. We'll see you tomorrow.